Today on the Relationship Renovation Podcast, we're continuing our discussion of emotional safety. And today we're talking about when one partner in the relationship is less expressive of their emotions. We talk about why this might happen. We talk about the impact that it has on relationships. And then we give you some practical tools to engage in a kind, loving conversation with your partner in order to create more balance, more openness, and creating a lovely, emotionally safe environment in your relationship. So stay tuned. I know you're gonna get a lot out of this episode. Do you wanna feel more emotionally and intimately connected with your partner? Then we have the tool that is exactly right for you. We have a program called Relationship Renovation at Home. And it is an amazing way for you and your partner to have a structured way weekly to work together. Because we deserve awesomeness in our relationships. Just go to our website, relationshiprenovation.com. At the top, there's a link to at home program and it will give you a free lesson. If you want to just check it out and see if it's something that works for you and your partner, we know it will make a significant positive impact on your relationship. Hello all and welcome to the Relationship Renovation Podcast. I'm Tara Kerwin. And my name is EJ Kerwin. And we just wanted to take a second at the beginning of this episode just to sort of reintroduce ourselves and and tell you about you know, sort of who we are and how we came to this place. Tara and I are a married couple. We've been together about 13 years. We have a blended family. I brought in two boys. They were like four and two mm-hmm. when we first got together. And then we quickly and excitedly (laughs) on our honeymoon on our honeymoon got pregnant with twins and our life just like turned (laughs) upside down and you know in the midst of this we'd both been therapists for a long time before that yes and um Tara like had this sort of epiphany one day with our colicky twins screaming in the park (laughs) and called me up and said EJ we have to help couples if we are you know two therapists who are really struggling to make this happen and I'm wanting to drive away to Indiana Kentucky Kentucky that's that's where where your sister was (laughs) yeah you know if I want to bail on this so much and knowing what we know we have to really help couples I was very compelled because I mean, we have all the tools. We've always had a great relationship before the twins were born. We had great communication. I loved being with the two boys, two and four. We had them 50% of the time. So then 50% of the time we had just us. And and then I also figured when the twins came along, like, oh, EJ's done this twice before. Like, he'll know how to do everything. <laughs> and it literally just broke down. And I that morning on my run at Reed Park in Tucson, I felt compelled to help our community because I had no idea just how difficult and how stressful and how hard it would be to stay connected to you during that overwhelming time. And it was really hard. And so that is how our relationship renovation model came to be. We, I remember I called EJ and EJ's like, I don't like to do couples work, honey. It's really overwhelming. They're tough. You know, couples are tough. And And here I had been a couples counselor for like, I guess almost 15 years at that time. So I was like, oh no, just wait, let's talk about this together. So. And when we, we've spent the last decade, like Mm -hmm. formulating a method to work with couples, We've spent the last decade working on ourselves and that's really where the podcast was born out of is is how do we sort of in a personal way combine our clinical insight as therapists, yes. but also our personal experience as two people trying to make our, our love last and trying to stay connected. And so, and that's why we do this every week because we really, we care about each other and we care about making a positive impact on the world. Well, and we also know how difficult it has been and that staying connected during challenging times is one of the hardest things for couples to do, which why there is such a high divorce rate. And I know I love you and I know that what we have done and what we have developed works. That was the biggest piece. I remember like our very first couple way back when, and we had like, I think it started like at 12 weeks. It's now like an 18 kind of week model-ish. You know, some couples obviously need longer because of stability or infidelity, whatever. Every couple is so different, right? It's just a, it's a model to keep couples on a structured way, but obviously it's not cookie cutter. 
But um, I remember the first couple and I was like, EJ, is this going to work? <laughs> like I, I had no idea. And lo and behold, right, we have 15 therapists at our center now that are trained in our relationship renovation model. And it has been awesome. Yeah. So successful. Couples just sharing how they were able to like reconnect and have such a deeper level of intimacy. So yes, thank you yeah. for doing that reintroduction. Because I think we talked about ourselves on our very first podcast when our center used to be named He Said, She Said, because of you and I. Yeah. And I think that's a perfect segue into our, our topic today, which is an extension of what we've been talking about in the past few weeks. And, and the overall concept that we've been talking about is emotional safety, is, is something that we believe is at the, you know, at the real heart of a happy, healthy, connected relationship. And emotional safety is the ability to be who you are completely, you know, to to give and receive love to one another in a yeah. fluid way is to feel you can be your whole self in front of your partner, your your strengths and your areas of growth. Mm, taking emotional risks with your partner and it's going to be okay, trusting that that will be okay. When do we get to do that? We're usually rejected and and that's the thing like at the very bottom of human fear is that idea of being rejected. So a lot of us learn how to guard ourselves and protect ourselves from getting rejected. And so in, in the past few weeks, we've had an episode just about the concept mm -hmm. of emotional safety. We've had an episode about reactivity versus curiosity, mm -hmm. which is a definite obstacle in emotional safety. We had an episode all about just negative thoughts, about how those internally launching thoughts inside of our head oftentimes create really big barriers to be connected. Mm -hmm. And the next, what we see as an obstacle, you know, we talk about dynamics a lot of times here that exist in relationships. And the next one we want to talk about is what do you do when you have a partner who is a little less expressive or non-expressive of their feelings? Because, you know, the concept of emotional safety is I can share what's going on. I can receive what's going on from my partner. But one dynamic we see quite often yes. is that there's you know one partner who's a, who's way more verbal, way more <laughs> aware, way more able to say, "Hey, I need this or I want this or this is important this to is me. important to me." And then oftentimes there's another partner who is quite the opposite, who creates this counterbalance in the relationship where they don't express their needs. Or feelings. Or feelings. Or frustrations or anything, really. And, and they might seem like very stable even, you mm -hmm. know, but that doesn't mean they're not feeling things. And there's definitely a, a challenge when that exists within a partnership. Right. We've had many, many couples come in and one of the partners literally was so surprised by... I don't even know why we're here. I thought everything was fine. And then all of a sudden this blow up happened and my partner wants to separate or my partner wants to divorce. And like, we haven't even argued. Like I had no idea. I, I can't tell you how many of our therapists and how many couples you and I have seen that this is what it looks like when they come to session. And you know, that therapist is probably sitting there like, one partner is like on the verge of like totally leaving. This other partner didn't even know, yeah. oh, let's go into attachment, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that is one of the one of the dynamics that we see play out is that this partner is kind of keeping it inside. You know, mm -hmm. they're just not saying it. They may not even be aware of it, but it's like a there's a breaking point. And the breaking point honestly can go either way. The breaking point can be the inexpressive partner keeping it inside, has all the reasons inside their head of why they can't or why they shouldn't or why it won't be well received. And then they get to a place where they, they suddenly hit a crisis and they're like, they have all of this inside. But it can be the opposite as well, that the opposite partner feels more and more and more distant from the person and feels lonely and, and feels not yes. needed. Yeah. Just that lack of connection, like feeling anything with your partner. They basically both might be feeling numb. Yeah. Both partners just start to feel really, really disconnected. So why does this happen? Like in the, the couples you've seen, I mean, certainly it's something that exists mm -hmm. in our relationship as well. How do you see this, Tara? So there's, to me, there's multiple factors of why this would happen because there are some individuals 
that might have grown up in a home where there was so much conflict that conflict avoidance now is the way they protect themselves. And so, oh, I don't want to get into a fight or I don't want to upset my partner. So I'm just not going to say anything because they've learned that conflict is not safe. Let's just say someone grew up in a family where like their needs were not met or attuned to, like not even seen because there was like a lot of chaos in the family. So there's a lot of kids growing up understanding that like their needs aren't important. And so they just kind of learn that they don't really have needs, maybe the need to like financially provide or work or be a parent, but like that interpersonal need is not ever identified because it was never attuned to. As a child, there's also the piece of uncomfortable feelings and nervous system regulation that if you don't have an environment where you're raised, where people are helping you understand all the emotions and helping you process them and regulate them, if you have a strong emotion like anger or rage, you're immediately going to just shut it down or react very quickly to it because you don't. your nervous system does not know how to regulate that emotion. And that's really scary. So then you learn how to suppress it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think like most of our behaviors, you know, humans are like highly adaptive creatures. And what happens for an individual who becomes like less expressive or completely inexpressive is that there was something growing up where they internalize like it's not okay to have strong feelings. It's not okay to confront and so they they create this adaptive system you know they create this mm-hmm. adaptive system where oftentimes individuals like this they don't really even know that they're having feelings or they've their feelings have gotten so sort of truncated mm-hmm. that it's like you know they feel like either they're happy or they're mad you know right. that, that they tend to have like sort of polar feelings or they just like completely shut off, you know? We, we've mm-hmm. seen that certainly a lot, a lot with like an individual yeah. who's just like sort of flat. So interesting, let me just kind of, cause this is with a client I worked with yesterday. Cause I, I also think there's, you know, if you're in a relationship with a partner who does have like a higher emotional needs, if you know what I mean, like you can kind of learn in that relationship. Like, I think my partner's needs are more important than mine. So I'm just going to kind of set mine aside. And ne- it doesn't have to necessarily be attachment related, but like maybe again, you, you're in a relationship with a partner who like has significant needs all the time. And again, it's like this learned behavior of like, oh, my needs just aren't important and that's okay. I'm going to make sure my partner's okay. So yesterday I had an individual client and she deals with a lot. She's had a a lot of stuff happening with her. She's got ADD. She's got a lot of anxiety, some eating disorder stuff, and recently married. And, you know, her husband is this very like stable, this is how she describes him. I've never met him. Stable, secure. So she's been going through a lot of overwhelm this week and she's hiding it from her husband. She's like, I don't want him to think he married a crazy person. And I, right, like I had that gut like punch in my stomach, like, oh, Her shame is just so active right now. And when she was little, she was very invisible and she felt like she was crazy. So no one ever really attuned to her. And so she had to deal with everything herself. And she, you know, put on faces and played different roles for all these different people. And so she learned that like she has to like not show her true self because if she shows her true self, she will be invisible, discounted, rejected, whatever that means for her. And so I had this conversation with her yesterday around like, hey, I have a feeling I'm not sure that your partner would really want to know that you're struggling. And I understand that you're feeling a lot of shame around feeling crazy or acting like your mom. I said, but you being able to externalize it and ask for support from someone who really loves you is a huge emotional risk but I bet you that he's going to feel so grateful that you did that. And I also bet you modeling that, that, you know, not any human have I ever met is so stable that they aren't affected by emotions. I'm like, I bet your husband just has a very different way of showing his. Yours is very outward. And I bet you his is very inward. And you should be curious about that. And you should let him know 
I'm really afraid that you're going to judge me if I tell you that I felt so depressed this week. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's an interesting other dynamic there is when there is someone who keeps their emotions more sort of tucked away, they deal with stuff on their own, they're very self-sufficient, they're sort of sending a non-verbal mm -hmm. message to their partner yes. that like, hey, don't share your feelings, you know, like if you share your feelings, there's something wrong with you. And and then what happens is you mm -hmm. have two people who inevitably, I mean, that there's so many philosophies built around this idea that, hey, you know, the one thing we can count on is we're going to suffer. We're going to have hard times in yeah. this life. We're going to have hard times internally. There's going to be difficult things that come at us. And then you have two people that are in relationship that aren't able to support one another, you know, that, that aren't able to be there for each other, be open, have that emotional safety to connect in the most difficult mm -hmm. moments. And that's, I think there's like an intuitive understanding that we all have that that's when we actually need to be there for one another. Well, absolutely. And, you know, my heart goes out to this client because she kind of thinks that he's a better human than her and that she's less than you know, just because of her experiences growing up and other people shaming her for maybe having some mental health stuff. And like, you know, my session with her yesterday was like, how do you restructure that? Like you are a human that is full of a wide range of emotions and all of them are okay. And nobody is better than you or, and you are not less than. And she just started crying because I don't think she's ever been held in a space to get validated that she is awesome. Yeah, <laughs> She is awesome just the way she is. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because you're, I hear what you're saying is you're saying that the non-expressive partner, because this person actually is the expressive partner that, yeah. you're, that you're talking about. And what you're saying is in the dynamic of a person, of, of one partner who's, who's more withdrawn, that it, then it becomes very difficult for the person who has this natural ability or this natural desire to express themselves, that then they tuck away their feelings as well. Yeah. And then you end up with two individuals who aren't emotionally connected. Exactly, which then breaks down trust, right? I said, you know, one of the biggest pieces of secure attachment is trusting that your partner can handle it. But if you don't let your partner know, they never even get the chance ever. And that I'm so sad because I bet so many people have separated and divorced because they never even gave their partner a chance to understand what those needs were. Maybe because you didn't know what they were or how to communicate them. But it really makes me sad because once you get to that place, it's awesome because most of the time, especially in our work, your partner wants to hear what's happening for you and they want to meet your needs. It just hasn't been communicated in a way that feels... Yeah, they might not even know it. Yeah. yeah. And the dynamic we also see in this environment is that the partner of the non-expressive partner begins to think like, what do I even, what's my role in this relationship? Yes. Like if you don't ever come to me when you're stressed yes, out. I'm so glad you said that. If you don't ever tell me like, hey, I need this from you, then what's my purpose? You know, like, because we do, like you just said, like we do have sort of a innate desire to be there for our partner that we want to feel just like in our job, you yeah. know, or other aspects of our life where we want to feel useful. And that person begins to feel like, I just have no use. You know? Well, and this is where the imbalance looks like, oh, you got one partner that has all these meds that constantly needs emotional attention. And you've got the other partner that doesn't have any. And it just starts to feel like maybe there is one crazy person in this relationship. And, and that's not true, but it can feel that yeah. way. Or maybe I need to go out and find somebody who, you know, can be a better match for me. Instead of, and that's like the hallmark of our work is, when we notice that there's these dynamics, mm. they definitely point to our areas of growth. And so the area of growth for the person who is less expressive is finding a way to become more aware of what they're feeling and then finding a way to express it in a hearable way. Yeah. So what's the pathway? So when pathway. we've worked with, yeah, when we've worked with couples like this and there is that less expressive person, how do we help them see the importance of it and find a pathway out of it? I think 
to me, okay, so this is just me talking from my own experience when I'm working with my couples is just hearing the other partner say, I want to support you. I want to know your needs. Like I want to feel needed by you. That's like an opening, right? Because a lot of times people, partners don't say anything because they feel like it's going to be, they don't want to be a burden. They already see their partner overwhelmed. I just don't want to like, you know, step on toes. I don't want to like add too much to them. And that's not true. It's a false assumption that we get caught up in. And then, right, that dynamic happens. Yeah. You just nailed something. And that's, and I think this is super important for listeners to hear. You nailed a very basic communication technique that we teach couples, Ooh. which is I statements versus you statements, right? Because oftentimes the person who's the partner of the, of the less expressive partner comes in with a lot of you's, comes in with like, you're just a robot. You don't have any feelings. You don't let me know what's going on. And what they're doing is they're expressing a need. They're like, I want to be connected to you, but it, but it comes way, off like an about, accusation. Yeah. And I loved what you said there. You said like, I want to be connected to you. I want to be there to support you. I want to know your little inner workings. I want to, I want just to, like you know mine. Absolutely. You know all of mine. Absolutely. And so, so the beginning is like, is being able to communicate it in a way that feels like an invitation. And yes. we want to make invitations to our partner versus demands. And can I just say, when I've sat with couples where the non-expressive or less expressive person hears this, there might be a person, an individual where no one has ever wanted to know about them at all. Like they felt so invisible, so insignificant. They're just glad. They feel grateful they're in a relationship. When they hear that like this partner actually wants to know all of their stuff, it is so amazing and beautiful because you can just see the melting and the tears and the crumbling and the acceptance and the love. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah. But what happens right after that, oftentimes after that, like, oh my gosh, my partner actually cares, actually wants to be there, is this like look that I that I see. And sometimes it's just a question that's posed is like, well, how do I do that? Mm -hmm. You know, because because most of the time these individuals have created operating systems, they've adapted to the point where they're just like, I don't know. Exactly. Like, you know, like I have so many, you know, individuals who worked with where even when you put, you know, we have these little wheels in the office that have like a hundred different adjectives of, of emotions. Mm -hmm. And even when you're putting all those emotions in front of people to say, hey, pick one, like, how are you feeling today as you're sitting on the couch? Tell me how you're feeling. They're like, ah, I don't know. And that to me is my first entry point on helping this individual is like, helping them create a system of actually identifying what they're feeling because yeah. they've become so detached from it. It's why the check-ins are so great for couples and they love them. And even after they've kind of graduated, if you will, from our relationship renovation model, like they still do their check-ins because it feels so connecting because they get to still be in each other's emotional landscapes. It's one of the very first exercises we have couples do outside of our therapy sessions is to do these little check-ins and let each other know how you're feeling. And yeah. So the pathway that I'll often use with somebody is like, okay, so if you don't have the ability to just yank out sad or lonely mm -hmm. or overwhelmed or whatever, then let's start with what's going on in your body. Mm -hmm. Right. Let's notice like, okay, well, God, this conversation is difficult. And I just feel like, Ugh, I just feel like almost sick to my stomach or I feel pressure in my chest or I'm tight in my back. And a lot then, of jaw tightening. <laughs> yeah, and then it's like, okay, well, okay, we can work with that. So if if you're saying that you feel tight in your chest, now look at that that circle of words. What might that be? And he's like, well, I guess that's like, I guess I'm anxious, you know, mm. or man, I feel this heaviness in my the middle of my body. Well, mm. oh gosh, that... I guess that sounds kind of like sadness. And so it's like the, this like sort of dual effort mm. of like notice what's going on in your body and then, hey, can we build a vocabulary? Because that's the other thing, you know, like with our kids, like when they're having an emotional experience, we help them name it. Hey, it seems like you're feeling super frustrated. Is that what's going on? Yeah, that's what's going on. And then the kid knows it, right? 
But these individuals never got taught that. Nobody was curious about about how they were feeling. Mm. A lot of times they were just like, get your stuff together. And it's, I'm just remembering this one couple, we were very early on, it was like maybe the second or third session and we were about to start genograms, getting the whole family history and everything. And and the male partner started to cry and the female partner looked like she was in shock. She goes, I have never seen my husband cry, just like in shock. And of course I'm like, oh, what's this like for you? Oh my God, I love that he has emotions. Like, I was just like, wow. I mean, it, this is very real. Well, and, and then that's the next piece, right? Is if the partner who's wanting more can be welcoming of it, yeah. even if it's difficult things to hear. And it's just a different dynamic now. You're you're cultivating a totally different dynamic because it's been one-sided. And now it's like, hey, now you have to learn how to actually, because you're recognizing your partner does have needs and feelings too, not just about you. Yeah, You have to recognize how to support them and hold space for them as they have held space for you. Yeah. And that's been a little, I mean, so we can talk just briefly about like, cause you know, I am the less expressive partner mm-hmm. learning to be more expressive in this week. I was feeling some things and, and I opened up about it, but then I also just was like, you know, in a, in a funk for a day. And that was hard for you because you're not used to that. You got to kind of a tipping point with it at one point this week. And you were like, look, I just need, to, you know, you kind of like snapped I dealt with it me. for a day. Well, I kept thinking, because I remember like you expressed these feelings and I had no idea. And then I was like, so happy that you trusted me enough to express your feelings. And right, I could see you having uncomfortable moments throughout the day. And I just kept thinking, I'm his warm, fuzzy blanket. I'm his warm, fuzzy blanket. I'm his warm, fuzzy blanket. And then after like 48 hours, I was like, I don't want to be- It was not 48 hours. I'm going to say past (laughs) 24 I was like exhausted of being the warm, fuzzy blanket and I just like wanted it to be over. But I was like, no, this is new. This is good. EJ's been going to therapy to learn how to express his feelings better, how to set healthy boundaries. Like this is what I want. So I just had to do a lot of restructuring for myself too. But it's so funny because like I've been in like this great mood for the last few days and I'm like, how dare you be in this mood when I'm in a good mood? Because mine have been, right, I've been struggling with a lot of hormonal stuff and everything like that. And then I was like, no, that's not okay. Because EJ used to do that to me and that felt really bad. If he was in a good mood and I was whatever, he would judge me and I knew it and it sucked. So I was like, I'm gonna try to really not judge him right now, even though I'm in a good mood and I'm not gonna take on his stuff. And so I I feel like I did a good job. But again, it's kind of new to us because you're starting to take more emotional risks. Well, and and so I think that that's an incredible point when you're changing any dynamic, not just this one we're talking about today, is there also has to be this acceptance within your relationship that this is gonna be clunky and it's okay. Cause I remember it was like towards the end of the day and I actually felt like I had like reversed my mood and was feeling like, was actually feeling sort of positive, but you were sort of already in like your hangover around my mood. Mm. And, you know, I felt a little like shut down, like, you know, okay, well, you, you just got to get your shit together. And in the past, I would have then, that would have like internally gone, going back to the narrative, I would have thought, see, you know, you really can't, you really can't express yourself mm. because you'll just get shut down eventually anyway. And it's, mm. you know, and, but instead I was like, okay, this is going to be clunky. It's, it definitely feels clunky for me opening up in this way. And hey, I have to have some empathy for Tara that this is new for her. And I didn't let that narrative override. And I just accepted, like I would encourage all couples out there when you're changing dynamics, accept it's not going to be a U-turn. You know, I think that like, (laughs) that's a metaphor I use with couples a lot. Like whatever we're working on, we're not just like flipping a U-turn and going the opposite direction right away. That this is a gradual process and you have to be patient for it being bumpy Mm -hmm. for one or both people getting it wrong once in a while, Mm -hmm. you know, but it's worth it. And I could even see it with Tara. Like I could see, even though she got a little intolerant of it after a while, that I think she felt more connected at one point in the process by me opening up. Well, and this is, you know, I think this was actually a really important piece right here. I love that you're trusting me with your emotions because when you didn't come to me, 
I was like, does he just trust that I can't handle it? That sucks. So that's another symptom that happens is like this level of mistrust. Like the partner's like, well, doesn't he or she trust that I can handle their emotions that I want to take care of them? Do they see me as like, you know, just like not capable? So I, I know that you're trusting me now and that again, it's a transition and it's not overnight and it's not a light switch and it's all okay. And I'm going to get it wrong sometimes. And you're telling me when I get it wrong and I'm learning so it builds trust when you start to take that emotional risk yeah. for the less expressive partner. Yeah. So as always, when we have these conversations and if you're sitting listening to this and you're like, and it's just tweaking something inside mm-hmm. of you and you're like, gosh, I want to talk to my partner about this. You know, the way to address this with your partner later today or, or later in the week is just coming in with that curious, kind mindset mm-hmm. of like, hey, I heard this thing. And it's something I'd really like to talk to you about is, are you open to it? Mm -hmm. You know, we always want to sort of ask permission and then opening it up with something like, you know, do you think that one of us is more expressive than the other of our feelings? And how do you think that affects us? And and you can even go into the childhood stuff. Like, did you have needs where your needs attuned to like, how did your parents attune to your needs or did they even see you? Like that can be a very soft approach, like that curiosity around like how you learn to maybe not talk about your feelings. Yeah, yeah. but you know, just open up this conversation in an open-hearted, kind way with your partner and see where it takes you. Because what we notice is sometimes it's bumpy, but it oftentimes leads to a really sweet moment. And every single human has needs that are important and significant. I'm realizing that slowly. So thank you for listening. And as always, take care of yourselves, take care of each other. Bye-bye. Bye. Me and you just singing on the train. Me and you listening to the rain. Me and you, we are the same.